my character is such an important piece of building trust. Now, having said that, I can be the greatest of guys and not be competent at what I'm doing, and, I, and I've still got a flaw there. On the other hand, I can be, as you've already indicated, incredible when it comes to the X's and O's and the game itself, whatever sport it is that I might be working with. But, but if, if I've got flawed character, I mean, it just can't carry the day. With me today is, is one of the more um, respected baseball coaches of the last 40 years, probably, uh, Coach Sam Ringelman. Sam um, is a five-time Hall of Famer and coached all over the, the Midwest to great success. And um, Sam and I have never met, but I, I got to know of him through uh, Coach Ryan Thompson at Mid-American Nazarene, who played for Sam in college. So, Sam, thanks for, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, Rob, my pleasure. I'm glad to do it. So you have have quite the resume. Kind of give everybody listening, just take us through your career a little bit and the stops you had. And um, yeah. just yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I appreciate um, you asking me to do that. Yeah, I um, well, right after I completed graduate school at the University of Maryland, I was very fortunate to get into college coaching. My first job was actually at a place called John Wesley College, which was in Michigan, and unfortunately, the school was in trouble financially, ended up closing, and um, I was looking for a spot, and I landed at Mount Vernon Nazarene, uh, what was then college, is now university, and actually spent 10 years there. And um, uh, it's really the foundational part of my coaching, I believe, you know, when I look back on it. From there, I, I left mid-year and went to Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, and uh, actually was hired there as the pitching coach and recruiting coordinator and spent two years doing that. The guy I was working for, um, Itch Jones, uh, ended up taking the job at the University of Illinois, and I was um, uh, promoted and given the position as head baseball coach at Southern Illinois University and did that for four years. Felt like it turned into a job and the things that I really wanted to do in coaching and felt like I was called to do, um, I thought was being crowded out. And uh, so I had to make a really, really tough decision and um, and left that um, Division One scene and uh, went back to a Christian college setting, I spent five years at Bethel College in Mishawaka, Indiana actually coached my son there, and that's where I coached Ryan Thompson. Um, and then um, out of the clear blue, got a phone call uh, from the athletic director at Dallas Baptist University in Dallas, Texas, which was one of the top NAI programs in the country. They were actually moving towards NCAA uh, status. But um, I was asked to come in and take over and, frankly, to – create a different culture um, in that program and um, spent three years there, took two teams to the NIR World Series while I was there, and then um, left there and came back to my alma mater, uh, Spring Arbor University, and spent the last 14 years of my career there. It's a special place. Um, my wife and I met there over 50 years ago, and um, you know the start of my career uh, really um, – Got it. Got the impetus of that uh, while I was there playing for Coach Burbridge. I went back and actually spent the last his last two years uh, with him and transitioning. And unfortunately, in the second year, Rob, um, Coach was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and never actually finished out the second year we were together. But um, I was already positioned to take over as athletic director as well as the head baseball coach there and assumed those responsibilities and, and finished out in the last 14 years of my career. And at the um, end of the season in 2016, stepped away from it after 40 years. So, so that kind of brings it up to speed at that point. Well, tell us about, I imagine the move from division one back to NAI mm -hmm. is a yeah. abnormal move for a coach, but you said you wanted yeah. to, for my words, get back to 
to the things that really matter to, to you. Tell us about that transition and what mattered and just dive into that a little more. Sure. Well, I, I can tell you this. There was a there was a very specific thing that occurred, an, an incident that occurred that created a whole mind change uh, for me. The third year I was head coach there, we opened up the season at Oklahoma State University, which back then Gary Ward was the head coach there. And those of you who know baseball know the what he was um, and that's his best, team. That's like, what I'd call it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I know. Well, I had an assistant from Oklahoma. He thought it'd be a good idea to do that. So I'm not. anyway, we went in there and we had two game series with them. You know, and they were averaging 10 runs a game at that point in time. Just prolific offenses. We got beat the first day, had a decent game with them. The second game, the following day, we beat them two to one at their place which was just an incredible accomplishment. I had a young man on the mound that was just lights out and we scored two. They only got one. And um, anyway, we're done with the game. We've got a nine hour bus trip back to Carbondale from Stillwater, Oklahoma. And everybody had cleared out. I'm the last guy out of our dugout. I grabbed my satchel. I've got to go up and see our sports information director up in the press box. And I'm walking up in the stands, Rob, And frankly, as surely as I'm talking to you right now, God spoke to me and just said, so what? And then followed it with, what difference does this make? And I got to be honest with you, man, I was frozen in my tracks. I'd I'd spent a significant amount of time aspiring to be a Division I head coach. But I got there and it what happened was that it just turned into a job. And for me, I'm not saying this about every Christian guy that's out there coaching, um, and particularly guys at Division One level, because I know a number of guys that have, have been able to do it and do it well. But it wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to mentor and disciple young guys, and and not just on the baseball end of things. And um, it was very difficult in that environment to do it. Um, And so after a lot of thought, prayer, conversation with my wife, I I made a decision to leave that. It was my decision. Um, And I, I felt like that's what I needed to do to get back into an environment where I could do the things that I really felt called to do in coaching. You know, I know you're you're very, very interested in this whole transformational look that should be taking place in coaching. And I think that in essence, that's what this was about uh, for me, that I needed to be back in an environment where I could, in fact, be able to do the things at the level that I wanted to do them and felt called to do. So that was the thing. And, uh, you know, there were guys who would come up to me coaches convention and so on and say, you know, please explain to me why you would do that. And, you know, again, I think it it has to do just like with recruiting, we were always looking for the right fit. I needed to be in the right fit too. And in order to be able to do my job the way I wanted to do it, to maximize my potential as a coach um, and, and to have the kind of impact that I really wanted to have wasn't just about winning games. It was about developing young men, and I just felt like that environment didn't allow it. wasn't as conducive for me, Rob, probably is the best way to say it. I'd imagine that gave you a unique platform to talk to people about why you coach across yeah, the yeah. country. To, sure, if there's stories to share, I'd be interested. Well, I, I, for sure, because, you know, again, you know, I've, I've come back. Uh, multiple times, uh, particularly since I've retired and had conversations with guys, particularly younger coaches, who are trying to find their way through this. And, you know, that it, it forces you to answer a very, very important question, is that is, why are you doing what you're doing? And I think that um, that is the platform. I remember shortly after I retired, um, the guy who's the head coach at Taylor University in Upland, Indiana, is also athletic director there, who's doing a phenomenal job there. As a matter of fact, they made it to the NI World Series uh, this past year. 
And Kyle Gould is doing a, a phenomenal job. He asked me to come in and spend some time with his coaching staff. And so I met with people individually. And then I had a meeting with a group of coaches, about a half dozen coaches. And the young basketball coach was there. So, Coach, I, got, I want to ask you a question, but I, I have a comment before I do it. He said, I've talked with guys, multiple guys who have told me that I really need to probably prepare myself to find something other uh, other than what I'm currently doing as a career choice before this is all over with. And then he said, here's my question to you. How'd you do it for 40 years? And, and my response immediately, Rob, to him was, I never lost sight of why I was doing it. And I think that becomes the critical part um, of, of all of this is why do we do what we do? And uh, when we lose sight of that, and the only thing that drives us is winning, boy, it can get pretty lonely. And um, and it can get frustrating. And I and I, that's how you get burned out, because that's never enough. You know, I felt like at Southern Illinois University, if we won the day, forget it. We had to be back at it, trying to do the very same thing again tomorrow. And um, I value winning. And I love doing it. And uh, gosh, I had... I had some teams that were incredible, um, but it was about doing it the right way. And in the and in the end, investing into the lives of young men and building into them that ultimately made the difference and made my career what it what it turned out to be. Not not the fact that I won X number of games. It's interesting. I, I want to dig into the purpose piece more. Um, as I tell people, I was actually just in a meeting where I shared this with a faculty member. I don't think in my career I've seen many coaches let go for the X's and O's, the fundamentals. It's yeah. behavior that happens. It's a leadership thing. And it's easy as you get into it as a young coach to to state your purpose. But I think it's very difficult to be grounded in it, um, if that makes any sense. So yeah. when, you, when you talk to young coaches – how do you help them get grounded into that, the purpose of why they do what they do and find that? Yeah. Well, I, um, you know, I think that um, there, there are two ways in which trust is built, Rob. And both of them, in my opinion, are equally important. I, I don't think you can just say one is, is of more significance than the other, but they are both very, very important. One is, that if, if I want to build trust with the athletes with whom I'm working, I, I have to be able to demonstrate a level of competency of what I'm doing. So I, ha I have to be good. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I gotta, I've got to stay out in front of things, and i got to keep working at my craft to be the most exceptional in, in what I would call teacher um, that I can be. And so... You know, if an athlete comes to me and needs help and I can't provide it because I, I don't have the expertise, what's the chances that he or she is going to return to me to find out that information in the future? It's probably not going to take place. So that's one piece of it. The second piece is, can they trust my character? Can they trust who I am, who I say I am? Um, am I trustworthy? And um, to me, my character is such an important piece of building trust. Now, having said that, I can be the greatest of guys and not be competent at what I'm doing, and, I, and I've still got a flaw there. On the other hand, I can be, as you've already indicated, incredible when it comes to the X's and O's and the game itself, whatever sport it is that I might be working with. But, but if, if I've got flawed character, that, I mean, it just can't carry the day. It won't carry the day. It won't carry you in terms of longevity. And so to me, when I'm talking to young coaches about the importance of that, it's both of those things. Let me back up with that. Yep. You know, I, I I hear people talk about so and so, you know, as a great motivator. Da, da, da. I, I have moved away, or I did move away from that line of thinking, and because again, what that means is I got to walk into practice every day, and I got to find your switch and make sure that I flip it. And 
my my job, I and again, this is what I'm communicating to you. My job, and I think what your job is as a young coach, is every single day you inspire the people around you to get better. And you do that in how you go about what you do every single day, which means how you communicate, how you handle yourself, you know, everything that occurs in the course of uh, practice. Um, I mean, you're being watched. And so how do you handle that? And what level of energy do you bring? How do you build into the lives of your athletes? What is it that you're communicating that brings life into them? And those are the things that I think in the long haul are going to matter. And, um, I, you know, again, this this is a perspective that I've maintained throughout, particularly the latter part of my coaching. And that is that every single day when I walked out on the field or I was in the clubhouse with my guys, whatever the case might be, I, I understood that something of eternal significance could occur, Rob. And, and so when that is your perspective, that changes how you do this and, and what's really important. Now, is winning important? I think so. I mean, why do you spend so much time at it if you're, not, if you're not trying to get it done, you know? I think the greatest testament is, is to be able to have this incredible resolve, professional will, if you will, um, in what you're doing, and, and to be able to blend it with, with humility. I think that's a model that we, we need to work at and it needs and it and when it's identified when it's seen it needs to be pointed out because i don't think that it's it's as it's out there as much as we would like to see it or need to see it if that makes sense oh that makes perfect sense um i already have a page full of notes written um so tell me about so you had a part of your career you were also an athletic director yeah um I mean, to be a little vulnerable, some guilt I carry in my early years as AD was hiring young coaches who I thought were ready and weren't. And um, the hardships they faced, some stayed in coaching, some didn't. Yeah. Do you have any, for the ADs listening, how would you identify if a young coach was ready and the trust and you know, competency and character, the stuff you talked about, that makes perfect sense. How would you work at identifying that in a young coach? Well, I think first and foremost, um, the character piece has got to be in place. And you, you, can, you can gamble, if that's the right word, on um, the ongoing development and help with that. Um, I mean, there, there are avenues in which you can encourage, you know, as an athletic director, if you're hiring a young coach, things that you put in place, even outline Maybe demand is too strong of a word, but I think that it's appropriate that these are the kind of things that need to be done. Getting connected with other other veteran coaches who who have modeled things in such a way that um, it's clear, you know, it's that it's that line. Rob, success leaves clues. Get young coaches lined up with with coaches who have been successful and they're doing some things well. And um, they're modeling some things. So I think that there are things that you can do. To me, that's the easier part to see develop. Um, And obviously, you've got to have young coaches that, in fact, realize that they need to do that. And then secondly, they have a learning posture about them. Um, I think that's really critical. But if if you're gambling on character, you you'll be making the change as the athletic director, <laughs> yep. you know, at some point in time, because, because if there is a flaw there or there's some inconsistencies there, those things are going to rear their ugly head and create problems for you that you don't want. So I, you know, again, just the, the idea that you got to make sure that that person is solid and, um, and then that they really truly view coaching as an opportunity to to impact um by investing and developing and i and i think that you know again if they're just caught up in the winning part of it they, they don't know how to do the other things and they have to be taught that so 
you've got to you've got to create some mentoring relationships. I think, um, Rob, if you're going to hire young guys, young guys or young gals who just don't have the experience, just to turn them loose and expect them to figure it out on their own, um, I just don't think that's a very good. Yep. The, the the track record for that kind of stuff is probably not very good. Yeah, and I think as people get into the head coaching chair, they think they're ready till they get in it. And then yeah. by year, they realize how much they yeah. need to depend on other people in order to have a chance. Exactly. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit because I sure. want to talk about that holistic coaching. The other thing we talk about in this is coaching the modern athlete. And mm. something I really admire when I look at your resume is you got better with time. Yeah. And the tail end of your career was arguably your most successful I saw and played against some of those spring arbor teams they were unbelievable so how you would how'd you adapt because i while the core need of people i think stays the same kids kids are different over different generations so i give me your thoughts on just how you adapted and why you were so successful at the end of your career yeah well um part part of it had to do with the fact that that i took on a learning posture and and wanted to find out what was the most effective ways to be able to um, connect. And I, and I think that I'll give me a, for instance, Rob, last week I spent time with, with uh, an individual who was coaching um, JV basketball, <laughs> you know, and wanted to know about how do you build toughness into JV basketball girls? Um, and, and, we had a great conversation probably for 45 minutes about how to do that kind of thing, how to, how to make that happen. I say all that to say that I kept learning. Um, I kept reading. That's another thing that was really, really important for me. For the past 12 years, I've had reading goals. I mean, that was at the latter part of my coaching career as well. But I, I stayed on top of things. And probably the areas where I was the most interested was when it came to coaching leadership and the ability to communicate. And um, and I think that therein lies such a critical part of all of this. You know, how, do, how is it that you can um, be direct and communicate clearly and push and do it without being cruel and demeaning? Um, that's, a that's something that has to be worked at and you've got to have a game plan for that and you've got to work at that. And so to your point, I think it's interesting that you would observe what you did about my own career, because I would say what I would have said that about myself, that I felt like when I got to the point where I was 50 years old, um, I, I felt like I was doing my best work. And again, some of it had to do because of some of the competitive environments I was in and the things that I learned along the way. But I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I learned what I needed to communicate and and how to be able to do that in a more measured and clear manner. So I I think those are some things that come into play there. So when I hear, I hear measured. Yeah. Yeah. I hear not as much like a jerk. Is that fair? I'm curious. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and and again, I one of one of the great things that happened, Rob, during my career, and it actually happened while I was at Southern Illinois University. I had an opportunity to spend significant time with Harvey Dorfman, who at that point in time was probably the pioneer in sports psychology and professional baseball. He was working with the Oakland A's at that time. And he had written a book, The Mental Game of Baseball. And I actually ordered that for my entire team and coaching staff at Southern Illinois University. And I'm in the office one morning, get a phone call. And I pick up the phone just to answer it. And the other end of it, the guy says, this is Harvey Dorfman. You don't know who I am. And I'm la- I start laughing. I said, yeah, I do. I just bought your book. And he said, yeah, it's the reason I'm calling. What are you doing with it? Well, what happened out of that um, was he came in and spent three days with my staff and my players. And then later that spring, on his way to Madison, Wisconsin, out of spring training, he stopped by and spent another couple days with us. And 
Anyway, what, I say all that to say there were some, some really important things I learned from him. One of them was this. And, and again, this is the whole measured piece. And that is when coaches lose it, when they, when they get emotionally charged about what's going on out there, you know, whether it's in practice or team, the question needs to be asked, whose needs are being met right now? Yours? as a coach or the players that are involved. And man, like when that struck me, it's like, oh man, I got to rethink about how it is I'm going about what I'm doing and how I'm communicating, the tone I'm communicating, the volume I'm communicating, all those kind of things. Because as you indicated, you, I mean, you can come off in a manner that, um, really is demeaning Mm -hmm. and 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 what you're doing is you're satisfying your need because you're mad or you're upset or you're angry you're frustrated or you you know you've said this 20 times or whatever the case might be it doesn't fix a thing it doesn't change a thing a matter of fact it probably if anything causes an athlete to back up and when I say back up, I'm not just talking about physically, but I but I think emotionally and in engagement with you at that point. So um, those are, man, those are the things that I think that, you know, when you're talking about measured, you got to be calculated. If you're going to have a conversation that is about helping an athlete change his performance level, which is what I think is our responsibility to help them do that. It's going to take a measured conversation to to do that. And the words you select and how you frame that is really important. And I think that, you know, to your your earlier point, I got better that at that as I evolved as a coach, even into the latter part of my career. So hopefully that helps with some perspective on it. That, that does. I'd never heard it said like that of whose needs are being met right now because yeah. i think of a lot of the regrets i have as a young coach and it comes from emotional outbursts yeah. where i think my identity was getting threatened so it's making me look like a bad coach as opposed to trying to help our guys be the be the best they could be right right yeah. that's 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 good stuff how much so we're talking about impact on guys purpose how much does winning matter and I think your career proves that. I think some people think it can conf- winning can conflict with the holistic coaching approach. I think your career is probably proof they go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, how much does winning matter in all this? You think? Yeah. I I think it matters a great deal um, because you're pursuing excellence in what you're doing. I you know again the de- the deal is how do how do you how do you help young athletes? And I would say this for yourself, even as you're coaching to bring the very best version of you every single day in what you're doing. And, you know, the, the, the pursuit of excellence in everything that you're doing and, um, and ultimately when that, when that becomes the foundational piece um, and obviously there's, there's a lot of, multiple layers to that but when those things when those things are put into place and obviously there has to be some talent involved rob i mean you've you've coached at the collegiate level you know that um but the the bottom line is that oftentimes that stuff takes care of itself and um you know i one of the one of the very very highlights in terms of the outcomes, if you will, of coaching occurred all the way back in 2007. And um, we we ran 36 games in a row together. It was a winning streak. And you know this, having been around the game of baseball as long as you have, the chances of doing that are, <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculously so difficult, you know. Pretty sure I was an assistant on a staff that was one of your 30 cents. I didn't even go off. <laughs> You're welcome. You might have, you might have been. <laughs> but um, there was only one occasion during the course of that entire run that I talked about 
the winning aspect. What I did every single day, I was it was like a repeat. I mean, you know, the guy I should probably just have said to her, guys, I need somebody to tell me what we're gonna need to hear today. And that is that I need you to bring your A game every every day. Just bring your A game. I don't want your B game. I don't want your B plus. I want you to bring your A game. And I want you to play as hard as you can against the game itself, which means that you get a ball back to the pitcher. You got to give me your best running time. And because we're going to assume that something bad's going to happen on their end. Um, and so we practiced that way and we committed to that. And as a result of that, it led us to some things that who would have thought? And, you know, that the course of that year, Rob, um, the winning streak was unbelievable. We ended up 48 and five on the year. We were not ranked at the beginning of the year. No one even knew about us. We went to the NAI World Series and played for the national title. And uh, it was just a right. phenomenal run. And again, what I'm saying to you is that there was not a lot of conversation. There was more conversation in the stands with the parents. There was more superstition in the stands with the parents than <laughs> It was just hilarious, almost, you know, with what was going on. People sat in certain places and, you know, just all kinds of stuff you find out after after the fact. None of that bothered us because that wasn't what we were doing. Mm-hmm. Um, we were just, give me your best version of you every day and play as hard as you can against the game. And let's see what happens. And, you know, we turned around the following year, went back to the World Series. We did back-to-back years, much like Coach Thompson has done. And, um, but, but it wasn't about, this is, this is what we're trying to do. This is the process that we're going to use to get there. And the expectation is what you bring every single day in terms of your effort, your attitude, how important that is. And and if we're, if we're pushing the envelope every day to be the very best, then guess what? Um, We've got, we may have an opportunity to have something special happen. And so that's, that's the way I approached it. Did you did you see that coming? Not the thir- obviously you wouldn't ever think, gosh, thirty six games in a row, yeah. but that high level of performance from that that team specifically. Would you at the beginning of the year have seen that team being a great team? I I saw some things that I thought really gave us a chance to to be pretty good. I didn't. I mean, that was. I got to be, I mean, if I'm being honest, I would just say, man, that's, um, that was even beyond my wildest dreams when I look at all that took place and all transpired with that. However, I will say this, that, you know, again, another part of this um, in terms of bringing your A game every day and, and playing against the game is that we had to be very, very deliberate about what we were doing in practice to create the kind of environment where we could do that. And um, the competitiveness, the expectation about execution of things, um, the demands that we we're placing on one another, holding one another accountable for that. Um, and in a key part of this, Rob, which again, the, the whole approach to what, what we're doing in coaching, this holistic approach, and that is, do we have a game plan for handling adversity? that's going to take place in the course of games and in practices and how are we going to, how are we going to deal with that? And that was a part of what we were doing is I, I tried to do things. <laughs> this, this, I attempted as often as I could to do things, at least in a portion of our practice that would force failure on the part of our players, which means that they had to then adjust, which was the key. You know, that's what I was after. You got to, you got to figure this out. And um, so those were all things that were part part of all of that. Yeah, it's fascinating. There should be a book written about that season. Yeah. So last kind of line of questioning, if you will. Sure. Um, and I think you're in a unique spot to talk about this because you've been in the game but out of the game for a while. Yeah. Um, we talk a lot, especially uh, kind of post-COVID, that this generation – a student athlete has changed. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious your observations of working with Gen Z. So the kids born after 2000, how do you think they've changed and how do you think they've stayed the same? Yeah. I think they have more baggage. 
I think they're they're dealing with um, issues. Um, some of them are um, social issues. Um, there's stuff going on that that is at the forefront of their thought process that I think complicates things for them. Um, I I think you know Rob. I remember when. And you may you may have an experience like this as well. I, I remember this happening while I was at Spring Arbor and recruiting. That all of a sudden I, I've got a young man on campus for a campus visit, and I have two sets of parents. That's a whole different deal now. Yeah, <laughs> you yep. know. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to figure out who 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 is the decision maker, who carries the weight in this thing. And who's going to be the influencer, you know, and and all of a sudden you've got those kinds of things that are are impacting, which I think um, certainly complicates things um, for them. And, you know, I think the, you mentioned the covid thing. There were already some issues that were going on that um, needed to be dealt with. This generation that you're talking about is so savvy when it comes to technology. And they spend inordinate amounts of time um, on in, on devices, let's face it. And um, to the point where they, they almost have created um, a sense of loneliness for themselves. Because I mean, they, as you well know, I mean, you can go on a, you can go on a bus trip for four or five hours with them as a team, and they're never communicating face to face. They're doing it by phone, mm-hmm. um, and and so you, you got to find some ways to cut through all that. Interesting. I I just read this. Um, in some of the research that came out of Stanford University as technic technically uh, savvy as they are in all the possible devices, media communication platforms that they use, they still value face-to-face conversation. Yes. And, and, and so I think from a coaching standpoint, even though you may use some of those means in which you communicate team-wise There is still an important, important part of this that necessitates as a coach that you are having one-on-one conversations with athletes and they they understand that they are important. Um, I think that is such a critical part of all of this. And so... We we make this allowance for them because they function differently than my generation, obviously. Um, but there's still value in face to face and communicating in that way, and sitting down with them and asking questions. Rob, to one of the most important things that I I think would be that quit assuming you know mm-hmm. as a coach, um, and. Being, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, being so careful about the words that you use, um, and I, and I think that those are those are all part of this in terms of of getting the inside to them to be able to to um, um, really get through, you know, unpacking the onion, if you will, and get to the layer that you need to be at where you can really, really have communication and build trust. And they know that. And so, yeah, I think there's, there are things, but that's, but I also say this, I think that there, in many ways, they want, they want some of the same things um, that your generation and generations beyond that all want, and they want to be successful. The, one of the, one of the issues is, and again, you having coached recently know this, and you're de- and you're seeing it undoubtedly. But there are multiple voices now in that are at them, yes, and and that complicates things. Um, 
you know, they're, they're specialized trainers, they're specialized hitting coaches, they're specialized pitching coaches, you know, and you got all this stuff going on. And so you've got multiple voices coming into play. And as a coach who has that athlete under your direction, you got to find your way through that. You know, what's, how do you appropriately handle that? And, um, you know, that whole line that, um, it's hard to have two masters, um, you're going to listen to one and not the other. Well, which one you're hoping you're still that one. And, um, and yet, you know, if you're getting conflicting information, sometimes it's also conflicting from parents. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of those things I think factor into it. And again, you have to have an awareness of that, that that's going on and, um, try to help them navigate their way through that without again, destroying them and what, what may be a good experience for them in terms of some of the things that they've learned. I think that was well articulated and it's kind of putting words to something I've been trying to wrap my mind around where I think for the modern coach with all the voices and I think kids have probably evolved for the good more than the worse in terms of, I think they can sniff out a fraud better than my generation. They're not going to blindly trust and most are going to demand to be treated with respect. Those are good things. Yeah. And something I don't think we expected out of coaches 20, 30 years ago necessarily. Yeah. Uh, but they need to be taught conflict management skills. Cause I don't think they they've learned that. And because they can sniff off, sniff out a fraud and they got all those voices in their head. Um, they have to be community builders and build this trustworthy community to have an impact. And essentially that's what team chemistry is. It's a community and uh, you have to do it quickly. (laughs) So that's a complex part of a coach's job now, I think. Well, I, you know, Rob, it's interesting you mentioned that because I, I, you know, people have asked me, you know, what is chemistry? What's your team chemistry? And when, when you, you cut through all the stuff, you know, there's all kinds of gimmicks on building it. The bottom line is this. Chemistry is about the strength of relationships you have with one another. Yep. That's that's where it's at. And if there's a breakdown there, chemist, chemistry is out the door. And, and so, um, you know, you can do all the team building exercises you want, and they have value. I understand that. But the reality of it is, what is the quality of relationships that exist? Coaching staff to players, players to players coaching staff to coaching staff and and all of those things factor into that to build the kind of community the kind of trust the kind of collaboration that you want um where you're where you truly are are looking to help a teammate get better today Mm -hmm. that's your responsibility that's how you lead um so those are all things that i think factor into it so and i won't go off too long on this but when we talk about the team building gimmicks and i put culture into that too everybody talks yeah. about culture culture yeah. culture and yeah. i don't think they take time to understand what that is but the minute i hear a coach say my culture yeah. i think they've lost their team yeah <laughs> takes, that's right it's a lot of people to, to have our it's an hour thing yeah yeah it's not your culture just so you know yeah <laughs> doesn't belong to you. Say that, you probably lost it so <laughs> yeah. anyways Bro, well, let me been, let me say one final yeah. thing or, or, or touch on one final area that I hopefully would be help to um, young coaches, maybe not, not just young coaches, but all of us in the coaching profession. And particularly, again, um, you know, when you're you've got athletic directors who are listening to this and they're trying to help develop young coaches here, here's something I think is extremely important that the development of players involves, in my opinion, anyway, five different areas. So every day when you go into practice or training, you, you've got to be looking at, do you have a game plan for all five of these areas? And, and what I think happens, the, the first area is, is skill development, whatever skills are necessary for whatever sport it is you're playing. But my, my notion is this, that the majority of our time is spent on that and that alone. And what we're trying to do is enhance skills because we think by enhancing skills, what's going to take place, those physical skills, they're going to give us a better chance to be successful out there. Well, there's some 
obvious truth in that, but it's only part of it. There's also, secondly, a knowledge that has to be that an athlete has to have, I, you know, again, if, if I'm using baseball as an example, I have to know my responsibilities on a cutoff and relay system. There's a cognitive part to this that I have responsibility for, and, and I have to make sure that I know what I'm doing. So I can't place someone who doesn't know what their responsibilities are. So I've got to make sure that I'm developing that you know, in, in, in the practice setting or you know, however it is that I'm teaching that, whatever whatever arena that might be, whether it's a game day or whether it's an actual practice. The third thing is the fitness part. And that's, you know, again, different for different levels and different for different teams and different for different sports, but certainly is a very, very important piece of that. And that has to be worked at. And I'm talking to Ryan Thompson right now at Mid-American Nazarene and the work that they are doing in the off season, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get faster and quicker and more agile. They want to be better athletes. Um, so there's a piece of it. Then comes the last two. And this is where I think coaches, coaches um, are negligent, if I can use that word. And that is, what are you doing every day to develop toughness? How are you building that into your practice? where you are being deliberate and intentional about the resolve necessary to be able to be a tough competitor. What are you, what are you doing? And as a coach, that, that requires a game plan and being deliberate. And again, coming back to this point earlier about being measured on how you're communicating things. That is, that is something that has to be delivered. And then the last one, and, and this, th these last two, I think, overlap, although they are distinct. And that is, what am I doing to develop emotional stability on the part of my athletes? In other words, when things go haywire, and they're going to, what is the, re what is the response? What is the appropriate response? And I come back to, to me, one of the single most important concepts in dealing with this part, and again, both the toughness and the emotional stability part, I think this applies, and that is this. When things go haywire and an athlete makes a mistake out there, the natural response most of the time is some kind of an emotional response. The easiest one to pick up on is body language. Um, you can see that immediately, His shoulder slump, you know, head drops, mm -hmm. you know, and kind of slouch, you know, and, and that becomes a response to what just took place. What has to happen if you are going to be able to demonstrate emotional stability is that you have to make a strategic response to what just took place. And I, and I just throw this out because I think it is the right question what is the what is the right next thing that I need to do? And that brings this thing back into where's my focus going to be and how do I stay on point even though I made a mistake because I've got to do the next right thing. And in order to do that, I got to be engaged at a level that I can't allow my emotions to take over and override this. To me, Rob, when I look at designing a practice schedule and putting together things, I've, I've got to make sure that all five of those are dealt with. Because if all I'm doing is dealing with the skill enhancement piece, when it comes to dealing with pressure, comes to dealing with failure um, in the course of whatever game it is that we are coaching, our athletes won't have a game plan. And they need to have, a, they need to have an answer for whatever is going to go on out there. So I'll leave you with that. And um, you may have a comment or two. Gonna, I'm not going to let you leave me with that. I'm going to follow a question, put you on the spot, define toughness for us. It's, it's making, it, it's making an appropriate response to negative things. It's demonstrating resolve, being resolute. I, I really like that word where, um, you know what? I, I, I just made a mistake. However, I I will get right back on point where I need to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, you know, my, my demeanor doesn't change. Um, 
you know, I, I, I actually used this word with um, Coach Thompson when I talked with his team about going into tournament play. I don't flinch. Things are going to happen. It's you know part of it. Part of it is, Rob, that we we get to the point where we think nothing bad should happen, <laughs> and so it's like we're caught off guard. Yep. What I want, what I tried to do in practice was to create things that would actually cause you to fail, so that you weren't caught off guard, so that you would know how to appropriately respond going forward. And then when you did, boy, that got reinforced, which is a whole nother issue in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think, again, the the toughness piece is, can I find an appropriate reaction? Can I stay neutral um, in all of this um, without letting my emotions override and, and just take me down a dark hole? And, you know, we've, we've all seen it where, one bad thing leads to four bad things. And it's, yeah, and it's turned into, yeah, it turned into one of my triggers as an AD when I watch coaches and they get so upset. Yeah. And it's like, you can't be upset by predictable things. Yeah. Stuff's going to happen and let's have a plan. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're exactly right. If you think your athletes are going to be perfect out there, I mean, get a grip. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Your job is to be in sport. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Your job, your job is to teach them and 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 have help them develop a plan to be able to deal with that, mm-hmm. so that they can effectively find their way through it. And it's not going to look great all the time, but it, but as they are working through it, you man, that's when you come alongside and say, "Hey, I saw this reaction today. Wow, what are uh, that's exactly mm-hmm. what we're after." You know, there are two words that have to be avoided, Rob. One of them is don't, which is the easiest, easy one. But here's the second one that gets abused all the time. And it's the word, but. So, you know, you're commending an athlete on what they're doing and then you, you follow it up. But if you would, so as soon as I hear the word, but what does that say to me? I didn't measure up to what I needed to do here. And so again, even, even in our, our use of, of our language, making sure that we're able to couch things, craft things, um, say things in such a way that it moves us towards being able to to help them find their way through the things that are going to happen out there, which not all of them are going to be good. Mm -hmm. And I think that, gosh, brings the conversation full circle of whose needs are being met right now. Exactly. Now we respond to that. That's right. That's right. So, um, well, we always wrap up with a rapid fire round. Okay. So you have no longer than 30 seconds to answer any of these questions. All right. And unless you're saying something really good, then I'll let you go. So <laughs> I got four or five of them with you. So um, so what is one book that has greatly influenced your life? One one book? Is that what you ask? Yes. And it's one I just read recently, and I would re- recommend it to every coach. It's called Extraordinary Influence by Dr. Tim Irwin. And I wish I'd have read it a lot earlier in my coaching, but uh, it really is a good insight on how to communicate uh, the right things. Do you have a favorite failure of yours? Whoa, favorite. <laughs> that's kind of an interest. That's it's almost... Uh, um, Find your way through that one. I gotta, I gotta think on that one for a minute, Rob. Give me another one. Let's see if we can come back to that. All right, all right. Um, how, as a coach, how did you define success in your work? Yeah. Um, every day, bringing energy to what I was doing, and um, building into the lives of the guys I was working with. That was my deal. I wanted to make sure that. Every single day, I, I left something that was substantive to them, and uh, that's that was key for me. Would you define success any differently as an athletic director? I don't think so. I think, man, alive. I you know, again, even when I served in that role, um, I realized I was I, I had another team I was coaching. So I was approaching it basically the same way. Obviously, there are other issues involved, but uh, 
doing that. And by the way, I would say this to you that people would ask me what I what I enjoyed so much about being athletic director. I told my staff, and they said, "What do you hate the most?" I said, "My staff." <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that applies to any other athletic directors out there, and maybe you're not staff. here. We just love our staff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, last one. In the last five years, mm-hmm. what new belief, behavior, or habit has most improved your life? Wow. You know, I think I think that um, I've just learned the importance of being disciplined in key areas in my life. And um, I, I've I want them to maintain, I mean, I, you you probably could figure this out anyway but you know i'm 72 years old and and i i want to finish this thing out kicking and screaming you know and um and it's because i want to keep learning and i think that 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 has been a key thing for me is that even though i quote retired officially i don't i don't want to stop what i'm doing and it's why I feel like I can go out and have some contribution to Mid American Nazarene at this point um, because I haven't stopped. Um, so I, I think that's probably the key thing is just stay disciplined in all areas of my life. And um, just because I'm not showing up and punching a clock every day doesn't mean I can't can't do some things of value. So, well said. I'm not going to let you revisit the failure one because I I can have an excuse to have you on again sometime soon. You have to answer that next time we talk. (laughs) All right. I'll give you plenty of time to think about it. (laughs) You know, part of the problem is my list is so long, I don't know which one to choose. (laughs) Uh, Well, Sam, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for for taking the time. And um, yeah, you, you lived up to the billing. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. And uh, I I hope when I get out there at some point in time that uh, maybe we can meet face to face. Uh, You you can count on that. So I'll make a trip up. All right. Good enough. All right. Thanks. Take care, brother. All right. See you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond Coaching. We hope today's discussion provided you with insights and understanding and leading. As always, thank you to the 3D Institute and Friends University for their support and passion for empowering leaders. And if you have any questions for today's guest or myself, all our contact information is in the show notes. Thanks for tuning in. Beyond Coaching is a podcast of the Impactful Coaching Project in partnership with Friends University. The Impactful Coaching Project seeks to develop coaches that coach the whole person. The Impactful Coaching Project is the thought leader in coaching the 21st century athlete and produces training, information, and original research to help coaches develop. For more information, check out impactfulcoachingproject.substack.com. Thank you for listening.